but we all have a picture like this, right? It's your eighth birthday, your smile's as big as your afro because you just opened up like the present you always wanted, which was your first chemistry set, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, from a bit of a geeky family. Um, here's a pic of me with my two sisters, Sheila, Mira, then there's me and Neil, my brother. And when I look at this picture, I see so many things. Um, I, I, it evokes a lot for me. I have memories of how we used to play with science when we were kids, uh, measuring pi with pots and pans. Um, but what I, what I wanted to show this to you for was because when I look at this picture, it, it helps me trace back what's become a bit of a professional preoccupation for me. Okay, you see, my two gorgeous sisters, Sheila and Mira, are actually both colorblind. And my brother, Neil, is, has retinitis pigmentosa, so he has very limited peripheral vision and um, is blind at night. And so this had some real implications in our family. I was the only normal-sighted sibling, and it led to a lot of discussions, you know, really important stuff, like Sheila, those shoes do not match that dress, that is eyeshadow, not lipstick, you know, roadside bingo was a bit of a challenge, um, and you can imagine that was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it was my introduction to an idea that I think is quite powerful, this idea that biology, as you know, miraculous as it is, sustaining our bodies, um, creating our experience of life, is also responsible for the way that we experience it. It was miraculous and fallible. Um, it was my introduction to biology as a technology. I followed this preoccupation through engineering. This is a theremin. It's a musical instrument. Does anyone know it? Yeah, yeah. awesome. Where you play it by waving your hands in front of antenna and you interfere with an, with an oscillating circuit and you make music. This is me giving my senior thesis presentation in college on, uh, with motion tracking. And can we mute the video, please? Thank you. And eventually, I landed in a field called tissue engineering, um, a field where we use um, technology and, by, and cells to be able to grow living spare parts for the human body. And this is a video of some beating heart tissue that I engineered during my PhD. And I'm now working on a startup called EpiBone, where we apply these same principles to developing living, human, personalized bone grafts um, we hope these living bone grafts can someday revolutionize the world of skeletal reconstruction. And I've often viewed my work as being part of this evolving story of how we view the body, this idea of body 1.0 up until only about 100 years ago, where basically we left the body alone and hoped for the best, towards about 100 years ago, where we started viewing the body as an assembly of spare parts. So if you need it, you know, analogous to the... Um, uh, the Industrial Revolution, and we started thinking about assembly lines, and if you needed a spare part for the human body, you might get it from a donor, or you might make a new heart, right? But the paradigm was still the same, this idea of viewing the body as spare parts, right? But we're moving forward towards this future where we can really think of cells as, as our bodies, as renewable resource of cells that we can use to regenerate new parts for the human body, right? And this is so cool. This idea is so cool to me, and I love participating in this story. But what I wanted to share with you today is that I think that this is really just one part of the story, a broader story, in that this is an evolution in thinking that applies not just to our own bodies, but how we view technology itself. What I want to tell you about is how I believe that we're witnessing an emergence of a technological revolution that is more efficient and more natural. I want to tell you that the time of live, building with living cells has arrived. Um, and I believe that these results are not only going to change the way we live, but how we view life itself. Imagine a world where energy is converted at a rate 10,000 times more efficiently than the sun, where batteries are alive, and where broken bridges break down and repair themselves every day. Ladies and gentlemen, we already live in that world. Can we go back one slide, please? Our mitochondria in every cell of our body, gram for gram, produce energy 10,000 times more efficiently than the sun. Every single cell in our bodies has a voltage across its cell membrane, and every bone in our body is broken down and repaired every day. This is amazing, and we're already living with this technology. 
And right now, we're at the middle of a beautiful collision of a couple technologies. As digital fabrication evolves towards allowing us to pattern living cells, okay, in 3D patterns, and as synthetic biology is coming online, where we're beginning to think of genetic circuits as Legos that we can rearrange and build as we like, we can imagine a not-too-distant future where we can design and fabricate rationally designed living systems. Okay, this is not biomimicry, copying nature. This is collaborating with biology. And so it behooves us to ask a question, a paradigm-shifting question. What can we do with cells? And in my own field of tissue engineering, this has taken the form of a dazzling array of examples. Tony Atala's work with bladders, engineering an optical cup in Japan, lungs and kidneys at Harold Ott's lab at Harvard, vasculature at Laura Nicholson's lab and in her company, Humicite, and even cancer in the case of Karen Berg's lab at Clemson University. But as I've been discovering more and more, I have friends in some of the oddest of places. Um, this is Suzanne Lee. She's a good friend. She's a fashion designer based in London who uses a kombucha-like slurry of bacteria and yeast, sugar and water to grow vegetable leather. And this leather can be used to grow everything from shoes to jackets. And meet Mitch Joachim. He's an architecture professor in New York City who asks, why not grow a home? and experiments with growing lattices that may someday serve as living walls. And meet Andras Forgax, he's the CEO of Modern Meadow, which is a company using biofabrication techniques not, not far from what I use to grow heart tissue, towards growing meat and leather. Asking, why grow fields of corn to feed the animals that we use for meat and leather if we can just grow the cells into those materials directly? And meet Damien Palin, he's a biomineralogist, that's a mouthful, who collaborates with bacteria to mine valuable minerals from desalination brine, which is the toxic byproduct um, from desalinating seawater. He's, creating, he's using these bacteria to create wealth from waste while protecting the environment. And meet Ingmar Rydell Cruz, he's a bioengineering professor at Stanford University who's got a pretty odd example. He's making video games using microbes as living pixels, okay? And the electrical signals that he uses to guide these paramecia around, this is a clip from his, um, one of his video games, where the paramecia are making the ball bounce around to get rid of the blocks, okay? So cool. And at the other end of the spectrum, literally, the product life cycle, meet Jay Rim Lee. Uh, she's an artist who's developed a strain of mushroom that she calls the infinity mushroom that can be used as an active element in a kind of living coffin that helps to remediate the wastes released into the environment as part of the decomposition process after death. It almost begs the question, what can't be done? But it also raises some important other questions, like would these kinds of technologies, what would that mean for us as a society if those technologies became mainstream? And I love this quote, the role of the artist is to ask questions, not answer them. And so thank goodness there are bio-artists in the mix using their biological skills to grow art that can help to contribute to the discussion. Meet Nareet Barshai. She's a bio-artist and founder of a space called GenSpace. It's the country's first biohacking lab, which is basically a gym membership model for, for biology. You pay 100 bucks a month and you can do your experiments um, and take classes and explore questions that you might not be able to explore in an academic lab. What Nareet likes to say is she likes to look at, not look for. And in one of her projects, she was exploring how bacteria, which are um, surprisingly social and collaborative, how they respond to the various topographies imposed on them on their landscapes by using various frequencies of sound. And she has many beautiful results, which she says are the result of looking at, not looking for. And, and a beautiful lens also for us to explore the role of topography in our own um, rhythms, in our own lives, and the way that we collaborate and socialize with each other as humans.
Meet Yonat Zur and Oren Katz, their husband and wife team and former Harvard Medical School research fellows who started a bio lab called Symbiotica in Australia for the express purpose of growing art. They ask the, you know, when people say, you've, you've heard this phrase, when pigs fly, as if to say, that'll never happen. They ask the question, what would pig wings look like? And so they grew them. They, <laughs> they also grew them in, in green and blue. And they made a so-called victimless leather jacket that was displayed at the New York City Museum of Modern Art. Do we sense a jacket theme here? And I like this project as well and from a, um, a show curated by Symbiotica um, called Portraits, painted with genetically glowing bacteria. Can you see in the Petri dish? It's, it's a face, it's a portrait. And it's, a, it's drawn by bacteria that are glowing, but they're also spliced with genes that have been implicated in Alzheimer's disease, okay? So as these portraits fade, they evoke the idea of lost memories. I hope that I'm convincing you that by learning to speak the language of cells that we can coax them into doing so much, saving lives, conserving the planet, inspiring unprecedented works of art, and above all, continuing to command our wonder. So what's next? I think the limits really are just our imagination. I can imagine living looms based on Ingmar's video games that weave fabrics based on Suzanne's microbes. <laughs> I can imagine T-bone steaks that EpiBone helps grow with modern meadow. But there are many interesting questions that must be addressed. Are we playing God? Is tinkering with the cellular material of viruses, bacteria, and plants and animals equal? And should there be different bars for tinkering with various life forms for the sake of research versus education versus entertainment? And if there are more bacterial cells in our body than human cells, and if we can grow human cells in the lab, what does it even mean to be human? Looking back, a lot of these questions echo those of past disruptive technologies, things like the, in the telegraph, which we can trace to the Victorian internet, we call it the Victorian Internet. And it wasn't so long ago that people were afraid of, of the risk of transmitting their own souls through blood donation. And we got through it. And to help with accelerating this familiarity and fluency with these kinds of technologies, I think places like GenSpace are going to play a really pivotal role, um, elevating um, the scientific literacy of our population in the bioethics discourse. So meet Stephen, Eliza and Aaron. They were students that I was lucky enough to help mentor at GenSpace, they're architecture students, exploring the idea of dynamic media content by learning to print living cells and tattoos on these living cells and watching them as they evolve. Okay, you can imagine what the bioethics discussions were at night after they actually learned to grow these cells with their own hands. My theory is basically that once you see DNA and feel it with your own hands, then crime scene shows and bioethics discussions are really never the same. That's strawberry DNA, by the way. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed your tour of the various ways that diverse people are exploring, collaborating with living systems, um, treating them as living building blocks, like this gorgeous Drosophila embryo. And since we're really at the beginning here, and speaking of Legos, and um, because I started with an awkward picture of myself, I thought I'd show you a better looking picture. This is my niece, Sonia, playing with her first choo-choo train made out of Legos, and I wanted to show that to you as I share my final thought. If the first industrial revolution was about machines, and the second about information, as we think ahead to the world that we're preparing for her, and the world that her generation will prepare for us, Aren't we excited at the prospect that the third industrial revolution can be about life? Thank you.